Okay, in this lecture, I'd like to talk about systems and energy, and then later we're going to circle back to efficiency. So, the the chapter in the book that this um, topic is covered by is called thermodynamics. All right, so obviously we're not going to cover all of thermo thermodynamics in one lecture. In fact, uh, if you're a mechanical engineering major or perhaps even a general engineering major, you're going to take a whole course in thermodynamics. Okay, but I wanted to give you some ideas of um, energy and how do you account for energy and the topics that are important for engineers to think about and know about. And the only way you get better at this is to, to just start working on it. So we're going to work on this and do some practice problems and, and move forward with this particular section of the course. Okay, so first of all, let's think about a system. We're going to apply these ideas to systems, and generally speaking, it's going to be useful to have uh, the system defined, defined by some system boundary. Okay, so here's a picture of a vehicle. Um, we put a system boundary around it, okay, and we'll see later on when we do specific examples on how we use the system boundary to do an energy accounting. Okay, so let's move forward with that. In general, when we talk about these things, when you draw a system boundary, one thing that gets lost is that there's typically an initial start time and an initial stop time. That's hard to show on a piece of paper. It's hard to show the evolution of time because um, you know, when you produce a document, it doesn't evolve over time, whereas something like a video does. Okay, So when you see the system boundaries, you need to think of it as some of the things we're going to be doing is we're going to look at an initial condition and a final condition. And that implies that there's some time elapsed to, to make that happen. Okay. Um, oh, I should, I should give credit. Uh, this presentation comes from Dr. Kelly, who's a mechanical engineer and uh, works in the mechanical engineering program and, in fact, also heads up the general engineering program. So. He has a lot of the, the, the work, the credit for this uh, PowerPoint presentation, so I want to give a shout out to that. Okay, so he comes up with these rules that an engineer must follow. I think it's a good, good set of rules. You, you define a system. Once you define it, you can't change it, right? Otherwise, you'll get you know, wrong answers. The system boundary can be any shape, but it must be closed, okay? So it, it must have some kind of bound to it. The system boundary can be rigid, or it can be, you know, defining a volume of space where it's fixed, or it can be flexible where it's around an object and the ob object can move, okay? So you, you see the differences there. Okay, next, we're going to be doing an accounting of energy. So what is energy? If you look at Webster, um, Energy is the capacity for doing work. If you look at dictionary.com, they get a little more specific. It's the power derived from the utilization of physical or chemical resources, okay, especially to provide light and heat or to work machines. Okay, so you think of power, you know, we think of maybe the electrical system, but how do you generate electricity? Uh, maybe solar or wind or burning of fossil fuels, all those kind of things. Uh, help provide energy, what we think of as energy. And then we take that energy, and the next topic here is unit of exchange. We take energy and we convert it to various forms. For example, we use electricity. Okay, electricity has a certain amount of energy associated with it. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get to the electrical unit. But then you can convert that energy into uh, light or or heat, or some other form of uh, useful work. Okay. Uh, another example is there's chemical energy stored in gasoline. Okay, so when you can convert that, you know, with a car engine to uh, to to it generates torque. All right, so the torque um, makes your car move forward. Uh, you could also use you know burn gasoline just simply for heat. All right, so it's a way of converting. The energy that's stored in the gasoline into something else, uh, an exchange of uh, energy. Okay, one final example, natural gas. You burn natural gas, you can generate electricity. 
or you can burn natural gas, heat up hot water to store the energy there. Right? So it's a way of uh, you know keeping track of energy. There's lots of different ways to think about it. Okay, and as an engineer, it's important to be able to 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 be con conversant in the way that uh, energy is converted and um, thought of, and you, you need to have a good mental model for how that would work. So Dr. Kelly put in this quote from Richard Feynman who talked about the idiocy of the different units that uh, people use for making uh, measurements of energy. So you can see from the, the title here, there's lots of different units, joules, ergs, you know, I, I've never used that one to tell you the truth, foot pounds, calories, BTUs, kilowatt hours, horsepower hours, all these things are ways to measure energy. Okay. And so, even if you look down, there's some derived units uh, like pascals times meter cubed gives you one joule. All right, so different ways, different forms to uh, to know about. Okay, so now we're going to get to the first law of thermodynamics, and you probably have heard something like this from uh, your high school classes. Uh, the first law of, of thermo thermodynamics can be thought of as the law of conservation of energy. Energy can't be created or destroyed. And to make sense of that statement, you really need to understand what we're talking about in terms of energy accounting. Okay, so that's where we're going. Um, we're going to look at equations where energy is converted to different forms. Okay, it can be transformed, it's converted to another form of work, or it's converted into heat, basically. So those are the ideas of, of the first law of thermodynamics. We're going to need to keep track or account for all these changes, and so uh, let's take a look at that. Right, one thing you can think of, and, and one thing that helps you learn uh, various concepts, is to try to relate this back to some other other thing that you're familiar with. Okay, so we all know hopefully about keeping track of money in your bank. All right, so you can account for the money in your bank. Uh, in this example, I have you know the final balance that you have is the difference. You know, final balance minus initial balance is equal to the deposits that you make minus the withdrawals minus any fees the bank might charge you. Okay, so when you look at the right side of the equation, you're having a net input into the account and the account accumulates. Okay, and so the implication here is that there's time involved. All right, um, there's a, a, an initial balance which implies a starting time and a final balance which implies an ending time. Okay, so here's a quick example. Let's say we start with a thousand dollars and you have a job and it pays you $500. Okay, so $500 is the deposit. You spend $800 on a laptop, that's a withdrawal. The bank charges you a fee, okay? So you have to strike off that fee. It's pretty obvious how much money you have. You start with 1,000, you add 500, you subtract 800, you subtract three. Okay, it ends up with a final balance. Okay, so the point is that there's this left side of the equation that's an, you know, essentially an accumulation side, okay? And then there's the right side of the equation that has to do with the specific transactions that cause a change in the accumulation, okay? So the same thing can hold when you start to look at accounting for energy, okay? So you have a final energy, Right? Remember, there's time involved. The final state minus the initial state is this, the input energy to the system minus the output energy that the system might provide to you. Okay? So it's an accounting, just like we did with a bank account. Okay? So within the system, you know, we have a boundary. Within the system, there's an accumulation. Okay? And so typically, we have a system boundary. I've already talked about how sometimes you put a box down on a piece of paper and it doesn't show the time element. But keep in mind there's going to be a final energy accumulation 
and, you know, a final energy minus an initial energy to look at the total accumulation. So within the boundary, there are things called state quantities. We'll go over those in just a second. And then coming in or out and crossing the boundaries is energy in different forms. And these are called path quantities because they have a path out of the system. Okay, so um, in general, you know, because we're looking at accumulations, the state quantities are equal to the path quantities when you take a, a look at the net of, uh, difference. Okay. Examples of state quantities. Okay, so I've had you read uh, from the Hagen book the different forms of uh, energy. So one of them is kinetic energy. Uh, the book, I think, calls that uh, work due to acceleration. Okay, so if you look at the change in kinetic energy, you can look at that work. All right. Uh, potential energy. Potential energy has to do with, you know, gravitational potential is one form. You can also uh, pull down a spring, you know, put an object on a spring, pull it down. It's got some potential energy as soon as you release that, the object's not moving. Okay. You can also store potential energy in an electric field. Uh, we store energy in capacitors and inductors and things like that when we look at uh, electrical components. Okay. There's also internal energy. Um, internal energy is associated with uh, atoms and molecules. So if you heat up a liquid, for example, the molecules move much faster and uh, the internal energy of the, of the liquid is changed. Okay. All right, so those are state quantities. What about path quantities? Well, path quantities involve how do you impart some energy into the into the system, okay, so you might, you know, turn a shaft that drives a propeller into a volume of liquid that heats that liquid up. We'll talk about that example in a second. Okay, so different forms of work that you use, um, or, you know, different forms of energy that gives you work is uh, part of what we call path quantities. Okay, heat is also important. Um, you know, notice that we excluded other than temperature showed up here on the work side of the path quantities, but energy flow due to temperature is also considered a path quantity. Okay, and then this last one is is um, something that we don't use that often when we actually do problems. Normally, we have a system boundary where the mass doesn't change with, across the boundary. Okay. But one thing I think up here, and the reason this term is important, is that there's energy associated with mass. Okay, so if you have, for example, a rocket, right? The rocket has rocket fuel, it burns, it burns hot and heavy, and it propels the rocket through, through space. So if you look at the system boundary, and the system boundary is a, around the rocket, then what you have crossing the boundary is exhaust, okay? And so you have fuel that's burning internally and, and exhaust coming out. There's mass associated with that exhaust, uh, the particles and so forth have energy associated with them. So you have to account for that, right? So that's what I think of when I think of the mass part of, uh, of the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, so normally we don't have to worry about the mass part because we don't do problems that involve changes in mass. Okay, so all that said, there's this universal accounting equation that I want you to be able to take a look at and understand where it's coming from. So basically, it's looking at this change in energy, okay, with the path, you know, change in the path quantities, all right? So state quantities on the left-hand side, path quantities on the right-hand side, okay? so. W in minus W out, that's the difference in work. Q in minus Q out, Q represents heat, okay? And M in minus M out, this, this equation can be a little misleading because we're talking about the energy associated with the mass, not the actual mass, all right? So how much mass changes affects how much energy crosses the boundary, but it's not literally, if you look at the units here, this is not in units of mass, it's units of energy to be consistent. 
dimensionally. Okay, so when we look at these changes, delta EK means you look at the kinetic energy final minus the kinetic energy initial. Okay, so all of these are changes in potential energy between one time instant, the starting time, or the final time and the starting time. Okay? All right, so we're just doing an accounting. It's a lot like a bank account. All right? So, in general, you're going to end up with a change that's the energy at the final time minus the energy at the initial time. Okay. <clears throat> so, on the other side of the equation, you can have work that's done onto the system and work done by the system. Okay, so that's one way to think of it. So, Work going in is work on the system. Work going out is work done by the system. Okay? All right, so let's now take a look at a few examples to see how you would apply this energy accounting equation. Okay, so one famous example is Joule's experiment. Okay, so let's think about how this works. We have a mass. All right, it's, uh, there's a pulley, and there's a shaft, and this is wound around the shaft. So envision, as I let go of this mass, gravity is going to pull this down, and it's caused this propeller to turn. Okay, and so I think you understand what's going to happen here. This mass is causing this change. This is going to spin. When you spin this, it's going to cause the molecules in the water to, you know, the state variable, right, that, that causes the water to heat up. Okay, so let's take a look at this in a little more detail. Okay, we can define a system boundary so that we know where we're talking about things so that we can do the accounting, right? It's like defining the uh, bank account in the uh, accounting analogy. Okay, so we have an initial time, the mass is in the raised position, and a final time, the mass falls and stops moving. Okay? We're going to assume there's no heat loss across the boundary. We have a perfect insulation. And now we're going to look at how the variables are related. Okay, so first of all, what is the work that's going into the system? Okay, well, work is equal to this force times distance, okay? So that was in chapter six of Hagen, work is force times distance, all right? Then we also know that force is mass times acceleration, okay? So in this case, it's the acceleration due to gravity, okay? So let's look at our accounting equation, all right? So we're looking here and we're thinking, all right, the system itself is not moving. There's no change in velocity, okay? There's also no change in position. We're not raising this up to a higher gravitational position. And so when we stay, start taking a look here, there's not going to be any change in the kinetic energy of the system. There's also not going to be any change in the potential energy of the system, okay? We're also looking at, are we applying any heat across the boundary? No, no changes in heat across the boundary. And there's no change in mass across the boundary. All right, so we look at this accounting equation and we get it down to this, okay? Where we're gonna have the change in the internal state, all right, the water is heating up, is given by the work done on the system. Is there any work done by the system? No, it's not producing any work that's coming back across this boundary, so we would also take that out of the equation. Okay, so that's that's what Joule's experiment was about. You, you perform this work on the system and it in turn changed the internal state of the, the water in the system. I mean, here's another example where we want to apply the energy accounting equation. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna do this problem where we have a ball that's suspended up to a height h, 
and we're going to drop that onto a spring. Okay, and so we define a system boundary okay, around this. Or you notice there's nothing, there's no work applied across the boundary. There's no mass change across the boundary. There's no heat change across the boundary. Those are going to be significant a little later on when we apply the accounting equation. Okay, so I'm going to show an intermediate step, all right, where you have the ball that's, that's, um, it's let go, and when you let it go, it falls, and it just touches the spring. Okay, so let's do that again. The ball just touches the spring. Okay, so it's moving at a velocity V max. All right, it's a maximum velocity because the spring starts to immediately slow it down. And then we get to a final state. Okay, the final state is where the velocity of the ball is zero again. Okay, so we're comparing, you know, what happens with the energy accounting equation between the initial condition and the final condition. All right, so let's go through it. Oh, and by the way, when this spring depresses, okay, or com compresses, it's going to compress by a distance x to stop the overall velocity. And to keep track of gravitational potential, you always need a baseline, all right? So we're going to have the same baseline. You can't change the baseline in the calculations, right? So it starts at this baseline, and it's going to stay there for the whole calculation. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to keep track of the forms of energy. And the relevant forms in this case are the kinetic energy, because we have you know, a starting point of velocity equals zero, then we change the velocity, and then we go back to velocity equals zero. So even though there's a change in the middle, we can look at the delta of the kinetic energy and make a conclusion. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. And then we're also taking a look at the gravitational potential energy and the potential energy due to the spring at different steps along the way. Okay, so let's get started with that. Initially, there's zero velocity, so there's zero kinetic energy. There's potential energy due to gravity, that's mgh. All right, the spring, you know, there's no we're not using the spring yet. The ball hadn't hit the spring. So there's zero potential energy due to the spring. Okay? <laughs> so at this intermediate point where the um, ball drops and just starts to touch the spring, you have 1 half mv max squared is equal to mgx. Okay? And so that you know, is a conservation of energy, right? You can actually use that equation to help you solve for x. Uh, if you know what, well, I'm sorry, not solve for x, but solve for v max if you know what x is, all right? All right, so that's the second part. Um, and the final condition here is we have a kinetic energy of zero because, again, the velocity is zero. The potential energy is exhausted, too, because um, we're right at the baseline. And so from there, everything is just potential energy due to the spring. Okay, so let's take a look at the universal accounting equation uh, between T initial and T final. Okay, you can also look at it between T initial and um, the intermediate time. You know, there's different times that you can look at it. It still has to be true for all times, okay, for all differences in times. Okay, so... Let's take a look at this equation. We have this universal accounting equation. And I already talked about the fact that there's no change in mass across the boundary. There's no change in heat across the boundary. There's no work being done to the system or by the system. Everything's within the boundary. Okay? So from there, if I'm looking at the difference between T initial and T final, there's no internal... You know, there's, we're not talking about uh, the internal state of the ball or the spring. Okay, so delta U is zero. And between initial and final, there's no change in kinetic energy at all because the velocity hasn't changed. 
All right. So what that tells me here is if I'm looking at the universal accounting equation, delta EP is equal to zero. Okay. So delta EP would be the difference between the potential energy. All right. So we have MGH minus one half kx squared equals zero, which means that MGH is equal to one half kx squared. Okay, and because of because of that, I can solve I can solve this equation. You know, I know the mass, I know the gravitational constant, I know the height. Okay, if I have the spring constant, I can solve for x. Okay. Right, so that, that leads me to the one final observation. If I know x, right, I can plug in here, and I know at this particular point in time, okay, you know, the, the energy, the kinetic energy is equal to the potential energy, and so I can set one half, you know, I can actually do changes, right? Delta k, zero minus this, Delta P M G H minus M G X is equal to zero, right? Which means one half M V max squared is equal to M G X. And since I already know X, I can solve for V max. All right, so you can see how this universal accounting equation can be used to, to, to help us solve different types of problems. And here's an example of one. Okay, so hopefully that's helpful. I realize there's a lot here. And it may take you a while to, to have this uh, start to sink in, but you know my, my advice is to don't fret it. Just try to get as much out of each of the problems that you can and relate them back to this um, you know, first law of thermodynamics.